today. Let's get started. Good morning, everybody. Let me just recap a bit what we said yesterday. Um, the, the goal uh, of our lectures is to write down the Boltzmann equations for CMB fluctuations in temperature and polarizations for both scalar and tensor perturbations to the metric. And yesterday, uh, we started describing the radiative transfer formalism that will, allows, that will allow us to um, reach uh, our, our goal. And uh, we introduced uh, this vector, n, which is not a Euclidean vector. I'm sorry that this might have caused some confusion yesterday. I wasn't totally clear. This n uh, um, is not intended as a Euclidean vector. It's just a um, compact form uh, to describe, to write down an equation for the evolution uh, of the fields that we use to characterize uh, the CMB properties. So this vector has three components, which are the three independent entries uh, of the polarization tensor. So we have T plus Q in the first component, and remember that we defined uh, this combination. Uh, if you define a given reference system, this will represent the number of photons along the x-axis of your reference system, or in other words, the longitudinal uh, part uh, of the polarized intensity. T minus, T minus Q is the second component, and this will be instead uh, the transversal component of the polarization field. And then we have the third component, which is uh, uh, related instead to the polarization along the 45 degree direction in your reference system. Then we say that uh, in analogy to what we did already for all the other uh, pieces of our puzzle, we can uh, expand uh, this vector uh, which is a small perturbation around uh, the, uh, the background uh, solutions uh, as uh, the unperturbed part, uh, which is N0, times, uh, uh, plus, sorry, <laughs> a small perturbation. And then the unperturbed part uh, is just an amplitude uh, which we factorize as N0, uh, which depends on both T and uh, P. And another uh, column vector, which simply has one, one in the first and second component and zero in the third, if we assume that at zero order, the CMB is not polarized. And therefore, we have Q and U equal to zero and only T remains. The uh, perturbation part uh, can be again factorized in terms of the, the, the uh, dependencies on the different variables that we are interested in. And so we factor out uh, the uh, P dependence uh, with this factor here, N0, F0, uh, which is defined uh, in this way. So F0 is the logarithmic derivative uh, of the uh, amplitude of the unperturbed uh, solution. And with this definition, let me just mention the following. Uh, if we consider the, uh, the Bose-Einstein distribution function, uh, that is the distribution function uh, used for photons, for example, and we uh, imagine to uh, tailor expand uh, this distribution function uh, uh, around uh, the, uh, the background solution, so the average, the average uh, temperature of the CMB, uh, then you can easily show that uh, if you uh, take the Taylor expansion with respect to the temperature, uh, that Taylor expansion can also be written in terms of the momentum. Remember what the uh, expression for the Bose-Einstein distribution has. And so at the end, uh, you remain with uh, the unperturbed solution. Sorry for the misomania. Let me make this... Uh, 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 Matkalef, <laughs> let's say, uh, to, to identify the, uh, the background solution, plus the first order expansion, which can be written as minus P, uh, the derivative of the distribution function with respect to P, times uh, the uh, fractional difference uh, in the temperature. Now, if we compare this expansion with the, the expansion of the n vector uh, that I showed you above, uh, 
uh, you can simply see that uh, we can draw um, uh, an analogy between the um, fractional difference in the temperature that arise when you tailor expand the Bose-Einstein distribution function with uh, the N1 perturbation to, uh, to the polarization tensor vector, let me call it in that way, with the two being more or less equal with a minus sign, so with, a, with an opposite sign. Uh, bear this in mind because this will be useful later when we uh, will write the, the final expression of the uh, Boltzmann uh, equation. Uh, then we plugged this expression yesterday uh, for the uh, perturbed uh, polarization tensor vector into the radiative transfer equation where we had, uh, we started from the, the usual uh, uh, Liouville operator on the left hand side and on the right hand side we had uh, the source terms for the uh, radiative transfer equation. So we had both a depleting term due to scattering along the line of sight plus a proper source term uh, which was due to scattering from different directions channeled through the line of sight and this scattering was expressed in terms of the scattering matrix times the, um, again, the uh, polarization tensor vector. We also uh, broke down uh, the uh, scattering matrix in terms of the sum of three different terms which had very uh, precise properties uh, under, uh, under rotations. So we factored that into three pieces uh, which were proportional to uh, different uh, M harmonics. Remember we had a M equal zero term plus M equal one plus M equal two. And we wrote down uh, what the integral over the phi uh, angular dependency of that matrix was. Uh, and that was useful when we came back uh, to the uh, full expression of the radiative transfer equation that you can start to understand uh, it's becoming very similar to the Boltzmann equations that we are aiming at. So when we focus on uh, uh, scalar perturbations, uh, we are able to write down the Liouville operator for uh, uh, scalar perturbations and this will give us uh, uh, rearranging all the terms, uh, this will give us on the left hand side uh, some global operator which has these three different terms uh, uh, um, inside uh, acting uh, on N1. Then we have uh, another operator which contains terms uh, that depend on the metric uh, and terms uh, that come from the Doppler effect due to scattering of CMB photons of moving electrons in the perturbed universe. And in this case, this operator is not acting on N1 because we are working at linear order. So here, since these are all linear order terms, here we need to multiply everything for the unperturbed vector. And so here we have the unperturbed part of the polarization tensor vector plus the scattering matrix. And remember that at the end uh, we said, okay, since this is the sum of three different terms with m equal zero, m equal one, and m equal two, uh, when we expand the phi dependence of the n vector because of the properties of the scattering matrix, only terms which has m uh, the absolute value of m smaller than or equal to uh, are meaningful in our expressions because all the others uh, when integrated over phi in this integral will give a vanishing result because of the delta m uh, that appears in the expression of uh, uh, the scattering matrix. We can go even farther and, and yes, I think that that was the last thing that we said yesterday. Now we can go even farther because we don't really care for uh, the three terms, uh, M0, M1, and M2, when we recognize that in order to make this equation here non-homogeneous, uh, the important term that we have to look at uh, 
is this one, is the one that multiplies the unperturbed part uh, of the n vector, because here we have the perturbation part n1, and here we have n1. So if this term uh, were not present, was not present in this equation, then we will have uh, an homogeneous equation for n1. Instead, because we have this term, uh, we might have some non-homogeneous equations for some harmonics uh, in which we expanded uh, n1. Now, this term does not depend on phi. There is no explicit dependence on phi uh, in, this, uh, in this term here. So this means that effectively, the only component of the harmonic expansion for N1 that obeys a non-homogeneous equation in this expression is the one with M equals zero. The one with M equal one will obey an homogeneous expression because this term will not be present when we write down the equation for that component. And the same applies to M equal two. Now the homogeneous equations are not uh, really interesting in our case because if we had that the initial values for uh, the expansion terms uh, that obey homogeneous equations were zero at the beginning, they would be zero uh, in the following evolutions. And even if they were not zero at the beginning, they will quickly decay because there will be no source term uh, here that will uh, uh, populate, uh, let's say, their, um, uh, their evolution. So this means that eventually the only uh, expansion term that we care about uh, in, uh, in our expression of N1 in case of scalar perturbations, because this property is coming from the property of this term here, which depends on the metric, the only term that we retain is the one with uh, M equals zero. And so at the end, we can write that the N1 part, uh, which in principle depends on eta mu t and p, can be written in this way, where this term contains uh, the dependency on p tilde and t, then we have N1 eta mu, and we don't have any phi dependency because the only term that we retain is the one with m equals zero, which will make the exponential part uh, uh, going to one. So this is the factorization of the uh, N1 vector in case of scalar perturbations. Now, uh, if you remember how the Q and pi zero matrices were defined, uh, you can compute the product uh, that, that is inside uh, that integral using also the property of the integral over d phi prime of uh, uh, pi zero. So we will not uh, go through all the calculations because those are just product between uh, matrix and, uh, and vector, so you can do that uh, yourself. There's, there is nothing really deep there. So I will write uh, the final expression here. Let me just write uh, the left-hand side uh, in a compact way like this. So this is exactly the term that appears there, which multiplies, which act, uh, acts, sorry, on N1, equal to, again, the term that depends on the metric and the Doppler, which acts on U, which is the one, one, zero unperturbed vector. And then we have the term that comes from the scattering matrix. And when you do all the calculations, you remain with the following expression. you integrate over phi prime, and so you just remain with an integration over mu prime, which is the theta angle. And here we have this vector whose components are two plus three mu square 
mu prime square minus two mu squared minus two mu prime squared acting on N1 plus, sorry, I will need more space, M squared N2. This is still the first, uh, the first component. Then we have the second component, which is easier. M prime squared N1 plus, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing indices, I call them N1 like this to indicate the different components of the vector plus N2. This is the second component of the vector that remains when you do the matrix vector multiplication. And finally, the third component is very easy because it, this is zero. Everything to start uh, doing some uh, uh, interpretations of this expression. So the first thing that we uh, that, that strikes our eyes is that here we have zero. Remember that u is uh, one, one, zero. And so the equation that we can write for the third component of n1, so this is n1, n2, and n3, so the third component of N3 obeys a very trivial equation, which says that N3 is identically zero in, uh, uh, in this formalism. So this is the proof that scalar perturbations are not able, if you remember that N3 is basically the U component of the polarization, this is telling us that scalar perturbations are not able to source uh, any U-like uh, um, polarization component. Why is, is this important? Uh, this is important because of what we said yesterday uh, when we extracted first the uh, definite spin uh, combination. spin two or spin minus two quantities. And then from those quantities, we also derived uh, uh, the scalar fields uh, uh, that we prefer to, to use. Like polarization fields out of uh, Q plus minus IU. Now, if U is equal to zero, then the E field is not affected because remember that uh, we wrote uh, the expansion coefficient uh, of the E field in spherical harmonics uh, as the sum of the expansion coefficients uh, of the two spin two and spin minus two quantities. So if U is equal to zero, then of course uh, Q plus minus IU would be identical to Q, but this will have no effect on the E part uh, of the CMB because these two coefficients will just be the same uh, and will give uh, whatever result for, a, for E. The interesting thing happens uh, if you remember that the B coefficient was instead proportional to the difference between the two expansion coefficients. Now, if these two expansion coefficients are the same because u is zero and therefore uh, they have the same, uh, the same value because the only term that remains is q, this means that b is zero. And since b is a scalar component, b will be identically zero in any reference system that we consider. So remember that we moved 
from QU to EB because QU are uh, reference frame uh, dependent. We need to define a reference system in order to identify Q and U because they are defined as polarization along X, polarization along Y and 45. So they depend on our choice of the reference system. However, because we can build scalar functions out of these uh, frame dependent quantities, uh, whatever property we are able to extract uh, about the scalar functions in a given reference system, for example, the fact that uh, U is equal to zero in the specific ref reference system that we use to write down this expression, this means that the same property, because B is a scalar, will apply to any other reference system. So no matter what reference system we use to derive this expression, and no matter what transformations we have to do in order to move from a given reference system to, for example, the laboratory reference system or to our experiment payload ground-based uh, uh, telescope that we use to observe the CMB, the B field would always be zero if we consider scalar perturbations because B is a scalar quantity. So this is a very important result because it's telling us that scalar perturbations to the metric are not able to source B-like polarization fields in the CMB. Now a bit of a spoiler, we will see that instead tensor perturbations are able to generate uh, a B-like pattern in the CMB. And this is why uh, in the CMB community, uh, the observation of primordial B modes of the CMB is such a holy grail uh, in, uh, in the community, because observing uh, a B-like pattern in the CMB will be a clear indication that we are observing something that was sourced by tensor perturbations to the metric. And this gives us a very powerful link uh, to uh, the predictions that we are able to obtain from inflation, because remember that tensor perturbations are another prediction uh, of our model of the early universe. The second result that we can extract from, from this equation is that at the end what we need uh, uh, to describe the CMB field in case of scalar perturbations are only two quantities. So we don't really need all the three components uh, of the N1 uh, vector. We only need two of them. Actually, we prefer to work uh, with uh, only two combinations uh, of the three components, uh, which at the end are only two. And we will use uh, these two combinations that are identified as alpha, which is the sum of N1 and N2. And remember how N1 and N2 are defined. This means that alpha is basically minus two times the T Stokes parameter. And then we work with uh, beta, which is simply the difference between N1 and N2. And again, if you remember the, the component, the definitions of the components, this will be minus two times uh, the Q Stokes parameter. Then, of course, from this, we can write uh, N1 uh, and N2 in terms on, of alpha and beta, then N1 uh, is simply alpha plus beta divided by two, and N2 is uh, alpha minus beta divided by two. So what we will do now is just to write uh, from that equation two equations, for uh, one for alpha and one from, for beta. And the way we do that is simply using the definition of alpha and beta. So we take uh, the equation for N1 and sum it uh, 
to the equation for n2, and this will give us the equation for alpha. So let's start uh, from alpha. And before I start writing, is everything clear up to now? Also from Zoom? Okay. So let's write an equation for alpha. Again, let me just write in a compact way the, the first term here with n1 plus n2, which will give me alpha. So I have the, the first operator that is acting on alpha. Then I have to sum the first and the second component here. So this will give me two times whatever thing I have in, in square brackets, which are the parts that depends on the metric and on the Doppler. And then I have to sum the first two components here in the scattering matrix. So I have this very same uh, uh, refactor. Then I have the integral over mu prime divided by two, where the two is coming when uh, instead of expressing these factors in terms of uh, the components of n, I use instead the definition of n1 and n2 in terms of alpha and beta. So I sum the, the first two components, and then I substitute the expression of n1 and n2 in terms of alpha and beta. And at the end, I remain with uh, this very long polynomial here, which is 2 plus 3 mu square, mu prime square, minus 2 mu square minus mu prime squared, which multiplies alpha plus beta, plus 1 plus mu square, which multiplies alpha minus beta. The next step is to simplify this expression using the properties uh, of the Legendre polynomial. So we will use uh, the following properties. First, uh, let me write down uh, the first uh, three Legendre polynomials, so the pi zero P0, 1, is just 1. P1 is just the argument of the Legend polynomial, which is mu. We called it mu. And the second one is 1 alpha. 3 mu square minus 1. And what I do here is to use this expression to write uh, mu square in terms of P2. So I will revert to this, exp this expression to write down mu square as a function of the Legendre polynomial. Because at the end, what I do is to rewrite that polynomial instead of using mu and mu prime, using uh, their expressions in terms of the Legendre polynomial. Why is that useful? Because then I can use uh, the properties of the Legendre polynomial. So remember that uh, we can expand a given field in uh, Legendre polynomial, and then 
if I call that field uh, x, uh, integrate x uh, over the mu component uh, and multiply it by the Legendre polynomial of order n, uh, this is to all effects a projection uh, of the field x uh, over the n component uh, of the basis uh, uh, given by all the Legendre polynomial. Now let me use uh, the expansion. Uh, let me remember the expansion of x. Uh, if I expand x uh, in uh, Legendre polynomial, uh, this will be the sum over m of 2m plus 1 minus i to the m, the expansion coefficient xm, the basis component pm, and then I have the pn here. But now I can use the fact that the Legendre polynomial are a basis and therefore uh, if I integrate uh, the product uh, of two Legendre polynomial uh, with different index, uh, this will give me either zero if m is different from n or the normalization factor which is one over two n plus one. So when I combine all of these properties, what I can say is the following. Whenever I have the integration over mu of a field x projected over p0, this will give me the x0 expansion coefficient of that field in Legendre polynomial. So this is actually a projection. And the same applies, let me just write the projection over p2 because at the end the only polynomials that we need to see there that we only have mu squared terms, so the only polynomials that we need are p0 and p2. This will give me minus, because I have a minus i here when I expand x, the expansion coefficient of order two. Now the things that we have to do is to uh, take out from this integral all terms uh, that do not depend on the integration variable. So whatever factorization we can find that take out uh, the mu square without the prime because the integration is over the primed variables. So whatever factorization we can find here that take out all the terms uh, that are not integrated uh, uh, over the primed uh, uh, variables uh, can be taken out. Whatever remains uh, inside, which is a function of uh, mu prime squared, uh, will be expressed uh, in terms uh, of Legendre polynomial. And then you can, uh, you can see if you do all these calculations that you remain uh, with the integrals uh, of that form, uh, the integrals over the mu prime variable times uh, alpha or beta times uh, either the Legendre polynomial of order zero or the Legendre polynomial of order two. So at the end, this equation will become the following. This is alpha, is not a fish. minus tau prime, alpha zero, minus one alpha, P2, the Legendre polynomial of order two, 
because when we take out uh, the unprimed mu coefficients, uh, we will do the reverse engineering thing. So we will write uh, the unprimed mu as the Legendre polynomial of order two. So this is why we have uh, P2 appearing here. And this P2 polynomial multiplies uh, alpha two, which is the expansion coefficient of alpha uh, of order two, plus B zero plus B two. So now I remember what alpha and beta are in terms of the Stokes parameters. Uh, no, no, because you will, you will use this uh, coefficient uh, when you expand uh, these integrals, so it will disappear when you do the algebra of, uh, of this polynomial. So here it remains uh, uh, as I wrote. So now I remember again what uh, alpha and beta are in terms of uh, uh, t and q. Let me use yet another notation because this is another possible notation that you can find, for example, in all the papers by Zaldarriaga and Seljak. So here, instead of T, I will use delta T, and it is understood that in writing this equation, these are the scalar delta T. And instead of Q, I will use delta P. Again, understood that this is scalar. So remember that delta T is minus alpha divided by two. So here I remain with minus delta T alpha, uh, no, two, sorry. I cannot even read, okay. Then here I don't have any alpha or beta component, so this uh, part remains as it is. And then here I have minus two delta T zero, minus one alpha, so all these terms uh, will give me a minus, so let me move it here. And so here with the uh, uh, two. And so here I remain with the delta T two plus delta P zero plus delta P two. And now the last thing that we need to do is to write finally an equation for delta, delta T. So let me divide everything by two, actually by minus two. And so I remain remembering again what these terms are. Finally, with the Boltzmann equation for the T component in case of scalar perturbations. So this is delta prime T plus I K mu delta T minus tau prime delta T equal to minus phi prime minus I K mu psi minus tau prime mu Vb minus tau prime delta t zero minus phi two half delta t two plus delta p zero 
plus delta P two. So finally, we arrived to the so long the Boltzmann equations for the T field in case of uh, scalar perturbations. The last thing that we need to characterize scalar perturbations is to write down the, the equation for delta P, which is the other independent variable that we need to characterize the CMB fields in case of scalar perturbations. And as you can imagine, the procedure is exactly the same. So instead of, ta instead of taking the, the sum uh, of the first two components uh, in, uh, in this equation here, you take the difference. Now, something interesting happens when you take the difference of the first two components, because if you take the difference of this, uh, this will uh, just vanish, this will just vanish which means that the equations for delta P doesn't have uh, source terms uh, that directly depends on the metric. This means that, remember what we said pictorically at the beginning, that the polarization of the CMB in case of scalar perturbations, but the same would apply to tensor perturbations, uh, is not directly sourced uh, by um, perturbations to the metric. Metric perturbations uh, are acting directly on the intensity of the CMB fields. What is generating the polarization in the CMB field uh, is the scattering part. Uh, is Thomson scattering, uh, and we will see that the main part uh, that remains uh, in this expression of the scattering matrix uh, is the quadruple, so it's the term with uh, L equal to the expansion coefficient uh, of order two, uh, is telling us that polarization is sourced by scattering and is sourced by the quadrupolar pattern of the scattering CMB. Remember the pictoric, uh, I think two lectures uh, ago, we really need a quadrupolar pattern in the CMB field in order to generate uh, polarization for scalar perturbations, but the same we'll see that applies also for tensor perturbations. So, uh, yeah, I don't think that I need uh, this uh, anymore. Actually, let me just uh, leave it uh, here. So when I write uh, the expression for uh, delta B, uh, sorry, for beta here, I have the operator acting on beta, then I have zero from this part, uh, and what remains uh, is the scattering part, uh, which is minus three over eight uh, tau prime. Uh, let me just write uh, this for you, so you can check uh, your results. And here you remain with this long polynomial, which is two plus three mu squared, mu prime squared, minus two mu squared minus three mu prime squared, which multiplies alpha plus beta, plus mu squared minus one, which multiplies alpha minus beta. Then again, move from beta to, uh, no, first uh, use the uh, properties of the Legendre polynomial to expand uh, uh, this, uh, this integral, to calculate uh, this integral, then move uh, from beta and alpha to uh, delta P and delta T, and at the end you remain with the Boltzmann equation for the polarization variable of the CMB field, which is delta prime P plus I K mu delta P minus tau prime delta P equal to tau prime half one minus P2, which multiplies delta T2, 
here it comes, the quadrupole, plus feedback from the very same polarization field. So delta P0 plus delta P2. So these are the main results of all these lengthy and apparently very contrived, but at the end, I think it's a very elegant formalism that doesn't use any complicated physics uh, uh, properties. Of course, you can repeat all these calculations in pure uh, quantum mechanics uh, using the uh, density matrix, uh, uh, write down uh, the expression of the uh, scattering term, the differential cross-section, multiplies all the uh, spins, uh, sum and multiplies over all the spins, combinations of the CMB photons, uh, but at the end, uh, you will end up uh, with the same uh, result as you should, because the, the physics is the same. But with this formalism, uh, we made use just of uh, uh, classical arguments uh, uh, but nevertheless, we were able to grasp uh, the main uh, physical points uh, of these derivations, which are, remember, for scalar perturbations, first, we only need two independent variables to characterize the field, the delta T and delta P variables. Uh, these are the same variables that were introduced, uh, for example, by Paul Nareff uh, when describing uh, the propagation of primordial gravitational fields uh, um, in, the, in the universe, and uh, uh, we, can, we can use the very same variables uh, for describing also scalar perturbations. Second, in the case of scalar perturbations, we don't have a U component, therefore we do not expect any B-like signal, we only have uh, an E-like uh, pattern. And third, uh, polarization perturbations are not directly sourced by the metric, uh, but instead they are sourced by scattering and uh, uh, first and foremost by the quadrupolar pattern of the CMB field. We need the quadrupolar pattern in the scattering CMB to generate uh, uh, polarization in the CMB fields. Now, before moving to, um, to, the, to the break, I think that this is a good time to have a break, but before doing that, let me just uh, remember that these two equations, these two Boltzmann equations, will give us a solution for delta T and delta P, uh, which are, if you remember, uh, the transfer functions uh, that we defined, uh, I think it was the first uh, or the second lecture, I don't remember, uh, that we can write the evolution of any perturbation field uh, in, um, uh, in the evolving universe as the um, product uh, of two parts, one part uh, which encodes uh, the stochasticity of the early universe processes, so those are the initial conditions uh, that at the end when we take uh, the variance uh, of the field, so the power spectrum will give us uh, the primordial power spectrum. And another part uh, which is the transfer function which is purely deterministic uh, and is telling us how these initial conditions propagate in the evolving universe uh, and this delta P and delta T are exactly the transfer functions uh, uh, that we want uh, to write uh, the expression of the uh, CMB field. So let me just uh, write uh, these final uh, expressions for scalars, and then we'll have uh, a 10 minute break. Okay, let me just uh, remind that if we call delta T uh, mu eta and K as the temperature polarization field, this can be factored as the delta T, let me call this tilde, to uh, differentiate between the uh, 
total field and delta t, which is the transfer function, which depends on eta, mu, and of course, uh, the Fourier mode that we are uh, uh, focusing on. Remember that that Boltzmann equation is written for a given uh, Fourier mode. We haven't included the dependency on k, but it is understood. That equation applies to any Fourier modes because at linear order, uh, each Fourier mode evolves independently. So here we have the transfer function that doesn't depend on k times uh, the perturbation uh, given by initial conditions, uh, which are k and uh, eta dependent. And so when we write down the, uh, the, the power spectrum uh, for those, uh, first uh, let me go uh, to uh, uh, exactly. I can make it, just one second. Okay. So let me first uh, write this. Uh, the temperature field in uh, real space uh, ob observed at a given direction uh, n. So this is the, the temperature field. This is now, uh, this is different from the end that we used before. This is indicating the direction of observation. This uh, would be given by the uh, sum, of course, uh, of all uh, the uh, Fourier modes uh, that we obtain from the solution of the Boltzmann equation times uh, the initial, uh, initial conditions. So when we take uh, the correlation of the temperature field, yes, why is uh, delta in depend on, uh, on eta? Uh, because uh, it depends uh, on the uh, evolution of the uh, initial fields uh, under the um, inflation conditions. I would say we have to evolve uh, the dynamics uh, of the field uh, in the early universe to obtain uh, the expression for the, uh, for the power spectrum uh, as the initial conditions. Let me think to a better answer to that, and uh, Joachim, I will uh, come back to you after the break, but thanks for, for the question. So when we take the um, correlation between the, uh, the temperature field, uh, and at the end, uh, we express uh, this correlation in terms of the uh, CL power spectrum, we will see, I hope that we have time to see it, but we will see that this uh, will give us uh, the following expression. For the CMB power spectrum. So the the last ingredient that we need after we got the solution of the uh, Boltzmann equations is to uh, relate 
the transfer function at a given time to uh, the transfer function at the time at which we perform the observation, which is the current time. And we will see how to do that. We, of course, need to solve uh, the, the Boltzmann equation, but we will see that there is a smart way of solving the, the Boltzmann equation in order to obtain uh, uh, this uh, uh, transfer function, this proper transfer function here. I'm using transfer function to refer to both, but uh, let's say that this is the transfer function uh, at the current time. Uh, and we can express finally the CMB power spectrum that, we, uh, that you saw yesterday uh, during the exercise session uh, as the sum actually is the integral because, uh, um, because it's, not a discrete, uh, uh, it's not a discrete sum, but you can think this as the sum of the contributions coming from all the Fourier modes uh, that we can write the Boltzmann equations for. Uh, weighted for the amplitude that each mode uh, is receiving uh, from the initial conditions. So weighted for uh, the power spectrum uh, of the uh, proper kind of perturbations, in this case uh, uh, of scalar uh, uh, perturbations. The same thing uh, can be said, of course, if, if instead of T here uh, we, have, uh, uh, we have the P transfer function, from P, we can go, uh, of course, to Q, uh, because P is directly uh, related to Q. Then we apply the spin uh, raising and spin lowering, uh, which in case of scalar perturbations, because of the fact that we don't have U uh, are, uh, uh, and we don't have phi dependencies, uh, are actually the same. So we apply the, uh, the spin raising and spin lowering operators twice to delta P. This will give us E, so we can write uh, an analogous expression uh, for the E field, similar to what we did for the T field, and we can write uh, the EE power spectrum, similarly in this case as the um, integral over the E this um, E transfer function squared weighted for the uh, scalar power spectrum. Of course, we can also consider the cross correlation between T and D. Remember that you yesterday saw also the TE power spectrum. And that will be simply given instead of uh, taking the transfer function squared uh, here, you will have. Uh, the product of the two transfer functions for the T and for the E field. So there are lots of information that we can extract from this, but before discussing this information, the next thing that we will do is to derive the Boltzmann equations and therefore the transfer functions in case of tensor perturbations. And then we will move to uh, more in detail uh, to the properties uh, of these transfer functions and how to obtain uh, the transfer functions that we need in order to compute the power spectra. So let's have a 10 minute break and reconvene at 10, 10 ish. Here we are, sorry for being late. Okay, now we will uh, repeat more or less everything for tensors, but before we do that, I'm destroying uh, all the chalks. Um, Joachim, you're right uh, in a sense that the initial perturbation part uh, does not depend uh, on eta, or let me say the, the dependence uh, that we have uh, uh, Onita is, is just because we are interested in uh, uh, the time at which uh, uh, these initial perturbations uh, are imprinted uh, uh, into the, the other species. So in reality, that, that eta is the initial eta, whatever you want to uh, define it, uh, which is uh, the time at which we can define the power spectrum uh, 
uh, of, the, uh, of the initial perturbations. So the eta dependence of the transfer function is uh, the, the right uh, time dependence, so it's the dependence that we uh, want to derive from the evolution of the Boltzmann equations, uh, whereas the eta dependence in the initial conditions is, uh, is not the same because that is just to remind us uh, that we want the, the initial conditions uh, uh, at, um, uh, at horizon crossing, which is the time at which uh, we, we define the power spectrum of initial perturbations. So thanks for, uh, for the question and for the opportunity to, uh, to correct that. Okay, now, now that we obtained uh, the equations for, uh, for scalars, uh, let us go back to, uh, to tensors uh, and we will do the same uh, that we did for scalars, hopefully uh, in, a, in a quicker way uh, this time. So uh, let's start uh, again from the usual uh, equation for, uh, for the n vector. This is the n vector, the one that has three components, uh, one for each uh, of t plus q, t minus q, and uh, u. So we have the Liouville operator acting uh, on this vector. This is equal to uh, tau dot this time, because here I'm still keeping uh, uh, the, uh, the time, not the conformal time, minus uh, tau dot over 4 pi, and here we have the scattering part, so integral over the solid angle, scattering matrix, and the n vector. Uh, one thing uh, uh, I, I realized that I'm using a prime uh, for uh, indicating the derivative with respect to conformal time, and it, I, I hope, uh, I, I didn't realize that, but I hope that I haven't confused you by using prime uh, in, in, in both cases. Uh, prime acting on all the uh, components that can have uh, a time derivative are the derivatives with respect to conformal time, whereas the prime that appears here is just to indicate uh, uh, the two different angular dependencies, the unprimed uh, angular dependencies, which are the one of the transfer function that we are writing the Boltzmann for, and the primed uh, angular dependencies, which are the one coming from all the other directions uh, in, uh, in the solid angle. Sorry, I, I just realized that uh, because of one question that came uh, uh, during the break. So. Uh, here, uh, well, this is the, the starting point that we used also for scalar perturbations. What we need to do now is to uh, express the Liouville operator for tensor perturbations. Remember it from the, from the first or second lectures. Uh, then, so use L for tensors. Then move uh, from T to eta. Use uh, instead of P, the PT in the variable. Use mu to indicate uh, the theta dependency and move uh, to Fourier space. When we do all of this, we end up with uh, the starting point uh, for tensors uh, and, uh, of course, uh, retain uh, only linear order contributions. And again, here we have uh, the starting point for uh, tensors which is derivative of N1, which is the perturbed part of the n vector plus i k mu n1 plus 
minus tau prime n1. This is equal to, and remember that in the case of scalars, here we have the, the part that depends on the metric, and the same we have for tensor. So we have uh, one half F0, N0. Remember that in the case of scalars, the metric part was multiplying uh, the zero order component of N because we are only keeping uh, first order terms. So here we have F0, N0, which is the same uh, uh, expansion that we used uh, uh, for, uh, for scalars. That expansion for N uh, does not depend on which kind of perturbations we are considering because that is uh, intrinsic uh, for, for N. And here we have the sum over the spin components uh, uh, of the tensor perturbations uh, to the metric, so H prime S. And then remember that in case of tensor perturbations, uh, uh, tensor perturbations introduces a mu dependence and a phi dependency uh, in, uh, in the perturbation fields. And finally, here we have uh, the scattering part. Okay, now we can write uh, two identical equations. Instead of keeping uh, the, the sum uh, of this uh, uh, spin component uh, for, the, um, for the tensor perturbations, uh, uh, so instead of keeping them in the Boltzmann equations, we can simplify this expression, uh, noting that uh, we can write two identical equations uh, for the two components uh, of tensors. So instead of keeping the sum, let's just choose uh, one of the two and write down the Boltzmann equation for that component, remembering at the end that the very same equation and the very same solution will apply uh, to, the other, uh, uh, to the other spin component. So let's simplify things. Instead of keeping the sum, choosing, for example, the plus uh, um, components, uh, uh, the, the plus degree of freedom of uh, tensor perturbations, and we will write everything for plus. And at the end, we will remember that uh, uh, we also need to take into account uh, uh, the, the cross. So when we do that, This can be simplified because uh, here we don't have uh, the sum anymore. Here we retain uh, just uh, plus. And uh, let's also uh, consider that, again, the same uh, thing can be said for the 2m components here in the dependency on the, on the phi angle, so let's write everything uh, for uh, uh, the, the plus component, and at the end uh, we will remember that we also need uh, the minus two when we write the full expression uh, for uh, uh, the polarization fields. And uh, again, uh, I always forgot uh, to include the, the vector part uh, here, sorry. Uh, we not only have the F0 and 0 coefficient, but here in the unperturbed uh, part of N, uh, we have the column uh, vector uh, uh, U. Uh, now, we do exactly the same that we did for uh, scalar perturbations. So we remember that the N1 component, which depends on uh, eta, mu, k, and phi, can be <coughs> factorized, uh, no, it's not k. I mean, it, it also depends on k, but uh, we are um, choosing just one of these. This is the p dependence. Uh, so we factor out 
the p dependence uh, with uh, the n0 f0 uh, factor here with uh, F0, which is the logarithmic derivative uh, uh, of N0 with respect to, uh, to P. Uh, then we expand the phi uh, dependency in, uh, in harmonics and we only keep in N1 the dependency on eta and mu. So this allows us to remove uh, the F0 and 0 dependency from uh, the Boltzmann equation because, because it can be factored out every time it appears in, uh, in N1. And then we use, uh, as we did for scalars, uh, we use the properties of the scattering matrix uh, to simplify the phi dependency here in N1. Remember that P is the sum of uh, P0, P1, P2. So for all the harmonics uh, with uh, M uh, larger than uh, two in absolute value, uh, we will have uh, trivial uh, uh, equations. Uh, not only we have trivial equations, but they disappear because of the delta that arises from here. So the scattering matrix allows us to retain only terms that have M here in, uh, in absolute value smaller than or equal to two. Furthermore, in case of scalar perturbations, remember that the properties uh, of the metric part uh, uh, of the uh, Boltzmann equation allowed us uh, to keep uh, out of the M0, M1, and M2 terms uh, only those uh, with M equal to zero because M1 and M2 obeyed uh, uh, homogeneous uh, equations uh, for, uh, for the evolution uh, of those contributions. The same argument can be used here, but now here we have uh, a phi dependency. So the metric part, uh, which is the part of the equation that allows us to write non-homogeneous uh, evolution equations, uh, has a different phi dependency. It depends on uh, m equal to. So the only terms that we retain in the phi dependency for n1 uh, are, are not m equal to zero in this case, but are m equal to two. So m equal to zero and m equal to one have homogeneous solutions and therefore we neglect them. They don't have any particular significance for us and we only keep terms uh, which have uh, m equal to two. Which means that uh, at the end, uh, the expression for n1 will be something like this. Our final solution will have a P dependence that comes from this coefficient. We'll have a phi dependence that comes from this coefficient that is obtained by the combination of the scattering properties and the metric properties. And we'll encode also a dependency on, on the time, of course, and on the mu, uh, on the mu variable. So if we take uh, all of these things uh, in consideration, we can uh, write down uh, we can substitute uh, this expression for n1 uh, in the equation that I wrote uh, above uh, and we obtain uh, a simplified form for that equation. So that form will be, again, let me just uh, uh, use this box uh, for short for the first uh, three terms uh, that act uh, on uh, the three components uh, of the n vector. Uh, 
Then we have uh, the metric part, uh, which is acting uh, on the u vector, so one, one, zero. And then we have the scattering part, uh, where, uh, again, we remember that we only need uh, to keep uh, the P2, this time the P2 uh, part uh, of the scattering matrix, and when we multiply the P2 part of the scattering matrix times uh, uh, the n vector, uh, we are left uh, with uh, this vector here, which has uh, mu prime squared, mu squared, n1, minus uh, mu squared uh, n2 minus uh, i mu squared uh, mu prime uh, n3. Uh, let me just notice here that we decided uh, to work uh, with uh, uh, the two uh, dependency here. We said let's write uh, an equation uh, for m uh, uh, equal to here, because the, the same equation or a very similar equation can be obtained uh, for m equal to minus two. Uh, since we are focusing on uh, m equal to, uh, when you use uh, the P2 part uh, uh, of, the, um, uh, of the scattering matrix, uh, uh, this will give you a minus i here, which comes from the uh, m equal to part of the P2 uh, component of the scattering matrix. Uh, should we uh, had worked with uh, m equal to minus 2, then here, uh, as you can imagine, we would have had uh, uh, plus i instead. So this is to tell you that uh, uh, the, the choice of uh, m equal to is completely arbitrary. You would have obtained the same results that we are going to obtain with the m equal to minus two, just uh, um, taking care of choosing uh, the, the, right, uh, uh, the right terms uh, in the summation. So the second component here is mi minus mu prime squared n1 plus n2 plus i mu prime n3. And then the third component, uh, remember that the third component uh, in case of scalars uh, was zero and that allows us to uh, obtain the result that B like uh, polarization is zero in scalar perturbations. This time is not zero, but it's two i mu, mu prime squared n1 minus uh, mu n2 plus mu mu prime n3. Okay, so this time it seems that we have uh, three independent, independent components because we cannot use the same argument that we used uh, uh, before uh, when this part uh, uh, here was, uh, uh, was equal to zero. Nevertheless, uh, you can show that uh, only two uh, out of the uh, possible combinations of uh, N1, N2, and N3 are really independent from each other. So there is one combination of the three which is similar to say that uh, out of these three components, we only need two. Only two of them are uh, independent uh, uh, from, from each other. We can build a combination of these three equations that satisfies uh, an homogeneous uh, uh, evolution equation and therefore doesn't carry any uh, particular meaning because if it were zero at the beginning, uh, uh, would remain zero as the evolution goes on. And this combination is the following one. So the combination of 2i mu n1 minus n2 minus plus, depending on which choice of the phi dependence you want to retain, 
1 plus uh, mu square uh, and 3 can be taken to be 0. So from this combination, we can write, uh, we can see that we can write uh, one of the three components as a function of the others, for example, uh, the, the n3 component. And so we can write that n3 uh, is uh, minus uh, plus uh, 2i mu n1 minus uh, n2. And we will use uh, uh, later this result. Then we are left with two other combinations of N1 and N2 that carries physical meaning uh, as we did for scalars. And so similarly to scalars, we define the alpha and beta functions. Uh, with alpha this time, uh, having uh, um, also to include the mu dependency that comes from uh, uh, had to work in, um, in tensor perturbations. So this time, uh, we have that uh, n1 plus uh, n2 will not be simply equal to alpha as it was in case of scalar perturbations, but instead we choose uh, to define alpha in such a way that it also includes the mu dependency. And the same we do for uh, beta. So beta will be one plus mu squared this time. And again, remember what n1 and n2 were. n1 is t plus q and n2 is t minus q. So here we have that Let me use the same uh, Zaldariaga variables. So the delta t in case of tensor, this time it is understood that this is for tensors. And uh, n1 minus uh, n2 will be instead the delta p for tensors. And from this, you can see that, of course, you can write uh, n1 and n2 as a function of alpha and beta. Why we need to do that? Because as you can imagine, we will use this uh, here. So n1 is uh, one alpha, one minus uh, mu squared alpha plus uh, one plus uh, mu squared beta. And with no surprise, uh, n2 is uh, one alpha, one minus uh, mu squared alpha minus uh, one plus uh, mu squared beta. So the very same uh, procedure that we used for scalars will be now applied to tensor perturbations. Let me just use, what time is it? 47. Let me just use uh, uh, two minutes to write uh, the final expression uh, for the Boltzmann equation in case of uh, uh, tensor perturbations. Uh, it's really the very same procedure, nothing uh, uh, particularly important. What we do is that we write an equation for uh, alpha uh, and for beta. Again, uh, summing, first summing uh, the first two components uh, uh, of this vectorial equation uh, and then uh, subtracting the first two components uh, to obtain an equation for, uh, for alpha, so uh, for beta, sorry. So in case of alpha, uh, we remain with, uh, with the following. Then here we have uh, one minus mu square h prime uh, uh, cross minus uh, 3, 8 uh, tau prime. We have the integral over mu prime half. Uh, then we can factor out uh, one minus uh, mu square. Uh, that at the end we can also take out uh, 
from the integral because this is uh, over mu primed. And uh, here, when we write everything in terms of alpha and beta, we are left with uh, one minus uh, uh, mu prime squared squared alpha over two minus one plus mu prime squared squared beta over two minus two mu prime squared beta. Next thing, we use the properties of the Legendre. This time, uh, you see that we will have also terms that are uh, uh, fourth order in mu prime. So we also need uh, uh, to include in our list of uh, Legendre properties what happens with the projection over P4. So this will give us uh, the uh, X4 uh, expansion coefficient of the field uh, on which, uh, uh, which we are projecting over the Legendre polynomial. And then we also need uh, to use the expression uh, of the Legendre polynomial of order four uh, as a function of mu. And when you use that, uh, you can uh, revert that expression and write down uh, mu to the fourth uh, as uh, a function of uh, Legendre polynomial. So this will give us uh, mu to the four equal to eight over 35 P4 plus four over seven P2 plus one over five P0. So next thing you do, you expand uh, this, uh, uh, this expression here. You integrate over mu prime using the properties of the Legendre polynomial and you end up finally uh, with an a Boltzmann equation for alpha. Then you remember what alpha was uh, in terms of uh, delta t t. And so you are able finally to write down the Boltzmann equation. Uh, let me just drop uh, the, uh, the, the, the um, superscript uh, t there. Let me write the Boltzmann equation for the t field in case of tensor perturbations. So this time we have delta prime t plus i k mu delta t minus tau prime delta t equal to minus h prime alpha, h prime plus, remember that we are writing this for one component, minus uh, tau prime, a very long list uh, of source terms, which is uh, delta t zero over 10 plus uh, one seven delta t two plus uh, three over 70 delta t four. And then we have the feedback from polarization as we had for scalars. So three over five delta p zero plus uh, six over seven delta P2 plus, uh, minus uh, three over 70 delta P4. And uh, if you do the same for, uh, yes. Uh, le let me just uh, write uh, one line, the, the Boltzmann for, uh, for the P part, so we don't have to do that. I'm just writing, copying from the, from the notes uh, and leave it here. So this will be delta prime uh, P, A k mu delta P minus uh, tau prime delta P equal to tau prime, let me call, uh, this, uh, all of this thing in square bracket uh, as uh, big pi t, so is the source term in case of tensor perturbations, so I don't have to write it here again. And this too represents uh, the main results uh, of the lengthy calculations that you can do and that will give you 
the Boltzmann equations for uh, T and P variables uh, in case of tensor perturbations. Uh, and again, observe that in the case of polarization, we don't have uh, a direct source terms that depends on the metric, uh, similar to the scalar case. So the metric is sourcing temperature fluctuations, uh, um, tensor temperature fluctuations. Then the quadrupolar pattern uh, in the temperature uh, uh, part uh, will be the source, uh, together with uh, the feedback from the other components, will be the source uh, of the polarization fluctuations in case of tensor perturbations. And sorry for taking uh, uh, so long. Apologies. We will start from here tomorrow. <laughs>